Should we put our trust in gold? Now for some years, uh, many patriots and conservatives and some Christian publications have been urging our people to buy silver as a hedge against the deflation of the American dollar and against the possibility that American currency would be practically worthless. Most of you know in history in 1921, 22, and 23 in Germany their money went from a rather stable medium of exchange to the point where it took a wheelbarrow load of money to buy a loaf of bread. And that's true. That actually happened and uh, it happened over a period of about 24 months. So many people, and I know some personally, have been buying uh, silver for some time and apparently millions of Americans will soon be buying gold in order to hedge against the fear of losing property or goods through the devaluation of the paper dollars. I have a little magazine in front of me titled Applied Christianity put out by Howard uh, Kirshner and he claims to be teaching what he calls Christian economics. In fact, I think that was the name of the publication before he changed it to Applied Christianity. This is June 1974. He has a two-page article, Why the Gold Standard? Question mark. He refers to the chapters of Exodus where the instructions for the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness are recorded. One cannot but notice the great number of times gold is mentioned and we'll be reading some of those in a few minutes. Then he goes on to say that gold has been the only stable medium of exchange in wars, famines, and all the cataclysms of the earth. He says, as long as this is the case, there is very good reason for the currency of our nation to be placed on a solid gold standard basis. Paper currency is convenient, but it should be backed up with gold. And then he continues for another half a page, about how paper money has lost value while gold has retained its purchasing power and concludes this way. A great people must find a way to maintain the value of its currency if greatness is to be maintained. The best known way to accomplish this is the utilization of the gold standard basis of value. The United States of America, which has removed its economy largely from the gold standard, should now return to this basis of value. Not to do so will be to continue our decline as a nation. To do so will be to inject new economic, moral, and spiritual power into the life of the nation. So Howard Kirshner, who has the ears of millions of patriotic Americans, says if we return to the gold standard, it will inject new moral and spiritual power into the nation. Well, I know people read these magazines, they'll read the newspaper, and many of them are getting very fearful about what is going to happen in America if and when our money collapses. So instead of reading any more of man's works, let's turn to what the Bible says and see what God says about gold or whether we should put our trust in gold in this end of the age. The first time gold is mentioned in the Bible is very early in the scripture in Genesis 2. This is the story of Eden and Eden's four rivers starting in verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and came into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is, it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon, and so on. He gives all of the four rivers, and in those five verses are the clues to the original location of the Garden of Eden. And right in it, God says the land has gold and the gold is good. Turn to Revelation 21 and we find the last mention of gold in God's word. 
Verse 2 I read, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then he continues with the description of the vision of New Jerusalem, including verse 18, And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Verse 21, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. So God's Bible begins in Eden with gold, and the gold was good, and it ends with New Jerusalem, a city made of pure gold. Now somewhere in between, we certainly should be able to find out what God says about gold and what our attitude and instruction regarding gold should be. The second mention of gold is in the 13th chapter of Genesis. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Now was Abram an evil man because he had silver and gold? Well, hardly, because this was true just shortly after we read of Abram in Genesis 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed." Here is the choosing of Father Abraham, and we find that he had much silver and much gold. Genesis 24 is the next one. It says in verse 1, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Now that must have included the gold and silver that he had. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So this is... Uh, Abram's instruction to the servant to go and find Isaac a wife, which he did. And he met Rebekah at the well. And then we read in verse 22 and 23, And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of a half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold, and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? Apparently, he purchased lodging and food with the gold that he gave to this girl who later turned out to be Rebekah and eventually the wife of Isaac. Genesis 24, we hear more of Abraham's wealth in verses 34 through 36. The servant said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold. So the silver and gold came from God to Abraham, and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and that would be Isaac, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. So Isaac the father of the Isaac sons, inherited all that Abraham had, including the gold and the silver. And then we read in verse 49 and on, the servant said, And now if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, and his master was Abraham, tell me, and if not tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, 
the thing proceedeth from the Lord, we cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord had spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth, and the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and gave them to Rebekah, he gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. So here this servant of Abraham gave Rebekah gold and silver and gave her relatives precious things, apparently as a dowry or a purchase price for the wife of Isaac. No condemnation in any of these verses so far of the use of gold. The next one is in Genesis 41. This is many years later, of course, and Joseph is in Egypt. And I read in verse 39, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Forasmuch as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Joseph is being made second in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a golden chain and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, Bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Apparently, the gold chain on Joseph's neck was the symbol of his power, and Joseph accepted it. He did not cast it off. Genesis 44 is the story of the other sons of Jacob coming to Egypt to buy grain. The first time they bought it, Joseph put all their money back in the sacks. They found it and took it back. This time he put a gold cup in Benjamin's sack, which they then had to deny stealing. Verses 7 and 8. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words, God forbid that thy servant should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sack's mouth we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? So these sons of Jacob, these eleven sons, brothers of Joseph, apparently had no desire or intention to steal gold or silver from the land of Egypt. And you know the rest of the story, of course. They were finally reunited. But the descendants stayed in the land of Egypt. And the next time we read of the mention of gold, we read something entirely different. Turn to Exodus 3. The Israelites have now been slaves in the land of Egypt for over two centuries. God tells Moses he will deliver them. Verse 19 through 22 of Exodus 3. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor, and of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Now isn't that strange? The uh, brothers of Joseph, when they originally went into the land of Egypt, were very careful not to steal silver and gold out of the land of Egypt. But here God says, I'm going to deliver the whole Israel people out of Egypt, and you're going to take Egypt's silver and gold with you. Turn to Exodus 
11. This is near the end of the signs and wonders that God did in Egypt. The end of the plagues. And God speaks again. Exodus 11, starting in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And in the margin of my Bible, and perhaps in yours, the word borrow there could have been translated demand. Let them demand of the Egyptians silver and gold, and God is about to deliver Israel out of the land of Egypt. In chapter 12 is the story of the Passover night as the Israel people kept the Passover of God. In verse 29 I read, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne under the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. God has brought all of the plagues upon the children of Egypt that he said he would. And in verse 30, And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Remember Moses' cry to Pharaoh was, Let my people go that we may serve God. Pharaoh continued, Also take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed, and again, the margin says, demanded, they demanded of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. We have seen a number of different uses of gold, including what seems to be a strange act of God Almighty of loading up the Israel people with gold and then sending them out into the wilderness where they couldn't spend it. Right? loaded them up with gold, took them out of Egypt, and sent them into the wilderness. Now, so far we've seen a number of things. I want to list these about gold this far in God's Word. Number one, there was gold in Eden, and it was good. Number two, the New Jerusalem is a city of gold. Number three, Godly Abraham had much gold and silver given to him by God. Number four, Isaac was to inherit it. Number five, gold and silver was used as a medium of exchange to purchase things. Gold and silver was used as gifts in marriage. Gold had a symbol of authority in the land of Egypt. It was not to be stolen even from other people or other nations, but when God began to deliver the children of Israel out of captivity, he forced the Egyptians to give gold and silver to Israel, and then God took them into the wilderness where they had no use for gold and silver, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Let's turn to the next mention of this gold and silver that the Israel people took from the Egyptians. This is in Exodus 20, 
and on, but first perhaps we should read enough in Exodus 19 and those few chapters to understand what happened to the Israel people before they put gold to use. Now remember, in the leaving of Egypt and on to Mount Sinai, there is absolutely no mention of gold. The next mention is after they were at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, God took Israel to himself to be his peculiar people. We'll start reading in verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the Lord. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So what we have here in effect is a marriage ceremony where God says, I will take you if you will do such and so. And the people said, We will. And the words, of course, were returned to God Almighty. Then we have the fantastic scene at Mount Sinai. Verse 16, It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And as you read this, just imagine in your minds what it was the children of Israel saw and heard. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. Now just think of this spectacular display of the might and power of God to these people who've just been brought out of Egypt and, of course, already have seen much of God's might and power in the plagues that he brought upon the Egyptians. Well, Moses went up to the mount, and then God told Moses to be sure the people didn't come through and touch the mountain, and he sent him back down, verse 25. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. And then in chapter 20, And God spake all these words, saying, Then follows the Ten Commandments. And sometimes we hear, so much about the commandments being given in stone that we forget that God gave the commandments by voice to the children of Israel. God spoke from the mountain and he said this. And all the children of Israel heard him. You know the Ten Commandments. They're in verses 2 through verse 17. And then immediately... At the end of God's speaking in an audible voice to the children of Israel, the Ten Commandments, verse 18, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die." They had had about all they could take of the voice of God. God spoke in a thundering voice from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. And they said to Moses, You can speak with us, but we don't want to hear God's voice anymore. We're liable to die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, and now here only Moses can hear, apparently, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven, and here is God's first instruction after the Ten Commandments. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. How about that? Here is a people laden with gold and silver that God had given them in the land of Egypt. They had no place to spend it or use it, although obviously from the scripture it had been used for many different purposes by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and even the children of Israel, the eleven sons, to buy things in Egypt in order to save Israel. It was a medium of exchange. We have seen in the end of the Bible that the New Jerusalem is called a city of gold with streets of gold. And here are these people given a display of thunder and lightning and power and God's voice beyond anything that any people have ever heard before. And the first thing God said through Moses to the children of Israel was, Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. Well, what were the children of Israel supposed to do with all that gold that God had given them and then sent them into the wilderness where they had no place to spend it. Well, first of all, let's read the first two commandments. You know them, verse 3 and 4. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And then... When he finished speaking to them, he told them, You'll not make gods of silver or gods of gold. Now, these people had so much gold and silver that apparently God knew the first thing they might do is start making gods out of silver and gold. Let's go to Deuteronomy 4 because we read that several weeks ago. In God's instructions through Moses as to what the children of Israel were to teach their children. That sermon was, What Shall You Teach Your Children? Some of you who may not have heard it, you might want copies of it. But anyway, Moses said, among other things, Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 and 10, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. And he was speaking of Egypt, the wilderness, and Sinai. And lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Specially, specially teach your sons the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, When the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And as we demonstrated in that sermon, the most important thing parents in Israel can teach their children is what happened at Mount Sinai what happened at Mount Sinai because no other people on earth have ever had God speak to them in an audible voice and give them the way of life. That's what Moses said it was. The way of life. The Ten Commandments were given from Mount Sinai and God spoke to these same people immediately after giving them the Ten Commandments, and he said to them, Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. It must have been very, very important in the eyes of God that the Israel people, laden with gold and silver, be told 
not to use it as an object of worship. And I'm stressing this, and I won't be able to finish today, I can see that, because there is a great danger facing Christians in America because of their government allowing them to own gold. Now, some do not see it. I do pray that we will see it in this study. Turn to Exodus 25. Remember the covenant that God made with the Israel people at Mount Sinai. It goes all the way from Exodus 19 through the Ten Commandments on through 21, 22, 23, and 24, at the end of which... Moses did this, or at the end of the speaking of all the commandments, Exodus 24, starting in verse 6. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. This was the blood of the oxen. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So now the Israel people are under a blood covenant with the Lord God Almighty which includes this emphasis on how they should not use gold and silver. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel... And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand. Also they saw God, and did eat and drink. More miracles, which we should teach our children. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Now they're going to be given in stone. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. And they said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come down unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. So apparently Joshua went up with Moses. And remember... Joshua is in the Hebrew, Yahshua, or the word that is translated salvation. So salvation went up with Moses into the mount to get the Ten Commandments, and the people were instructed to listen to Aaron and Hur, the high priest, the religious leader of the land, and the civil leader left in the place of Moses. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And remember now as we go on in this, that apparently from this verse the children of Israel could still see the glory of the Lord in the mountain during the time Moses was up in the mountain. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Now we're going to read the instructions that God gave Moses in the mount during this forty days and forty nights. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue. And it goes right on down through all of these things. In other words, now we're beginning to find out what gold and silver is to be used for in and by the children of Israel. You follow me? It was used for many purposes by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
nothing wrong with its use as a medium of exchange, nothing wrong as its use as a gift, apparently nothing wrong even in Egypt in its use as a symbol of authority, and it was something which the eleven sons of Jacob would not steal from the Egyptians, but God gave Israel an abundance of silver and gold and instructed them not to make gods out of them. And now he's telling Moses, have them give it willingly to you for me, an offering to God Almighty. This is the offering which he shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And he lists all these necessary things. And then in verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Are you beginning to see that there is a scriptural use for gold? A scriptural use for gold. God was going to use it to build himself a sanctuary to be among the children of Israel. A house for God as it were. Verse 9. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And I'm going to read quite a few verses here because I want to impress upon you how often gold is mentioned in the building of God's house or the tabernacle in the wilderness. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. A stave shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Now we know this was the tables of stone. Put in this ark, which was made almost completely out of wood and gold. Wood and gold. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And then in verse 22, And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all the things that I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. God would come and meet there, as we know, with the high priest in Israel in or on this ark and the mercy seat which was made of pure gold. Pure gold. Now, I know when people are told today to buy gold, the only thing they're told is, well, you buy it so you can have it to protect you. Now, we're going to see God has a great and wonderful use for gold in this age, and it's not what people think. Let's read on. In verse uh, 23, they were told to make a table. Verse 24, And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make, un and make thereto a crown of gold round about. Verse 29, And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all of pure gold, shalt thou make them. Verse 31, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knots and his flowers shall be of the same. In other words, all of gold. Verse 36, Their knots and their branches shall be of the same. All of it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. And look that thou make them after their pattern, 
which was showed thee in the mount. In chapter 26, Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twine linen, and blue and purple and scarlet, with cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. And then in verse 6, And thou shalt make fifty touches of gold, and couple the curtains together with the touches, and it shall be one tabernacle. Verse 25, And they shall be eight boards and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of one side of the tabernacle. Verse 29, And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold, and make their rings of gold for places for the bars, and thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And we'll go on next week, because, Lord willing, I'm going to impress upon you people that God has a story in His Word as to what we should do and what our association should be with gold. Because I believe a great and terrible thing may happen in America because of gold. But I'll demonstrate, Lord willing, next week what may happen to America if we do not use gold according to God's order and if we use it according to man. And I hope and pray we'll save a lot of people from making a very bad mistake by going through this study of gold. Let's stand. Our Father and our God, we pray in the name of Christ that you will give us of thy word. We know that thou hast spoken to our forefathers in an audible voice. We pray that you speak to us through thy word, that we may know thy will. In Jesus' name, amen.